Thanks. I'll begin with a word of prayer. So. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I uh, thank you for these students. Just pray that you bless this class, Lord. Help us to uh, use this time for your glory, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Alrighty, so I will begin with um, the non-zero division algorithm. So here's a theorem. Uh, this is 1.4.3 in my, in my notes. I don't, that's section, oh, that's right, section four of that. Anyway, non-zero division algorithm. <coughs> and so basically here's the deal. If we have A and B in the integers um, with B not equal to zero, then there exists a unique uh, quotient Q in the integers and remainder R and Z <coughs> for which <coughs> excuse me A is equal to Q times B plus R and where we have zero less than, or equal, less, less than or equal to r, less than the absolute value of b. So this is the, the non-zero uh, division algorithm. So uh, the proof, I, I, I have the proof typed up in the notes. You can read it. Uh, basically, what you do is you look at a particular set uh, constructed from these, from the theorem, I think you look at a set of things of the form A minus QB, all right, um, where A and B are positive, and, and you show that um, the existence of a smallest element implies the existence of the remainder. And then you take that and you tweak that argument a little bit to get negative things, and there you have it, the division algorithm. So, <clears throat> of course, this is just a result that guides our thinking. Um, so we need a little bit of terminology to go further. So some definitions for us. Definition, um, if A and B are integers, right, then we say B divides A B divides A if there exists C in the integers, right, um, such that what? A is equal to B times C, right? In this case, we say what? We say that um, <clears throat> this makes uh, also B is a factor of A in this case, right? What's our shorthand for B divides A? What do we write? B, yeah, vertical line A, like that, B divides A. That, of course, is not an operation. That is a statement, right? Yes, sir? Sorry, the point. There exists unique, yeah, definition. Um, if P, that means unique, uh, P is an element of the natural numbers such that uh, n divides p implies um, n equals to p or um, n equals to 1, then <clears throat> p is what? Indeed prime. I was going to have to fill in the blank, but you have filled in the blank already for me there. So yes, that's, that's what we mean by a prime. All right. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully this is a review. I mean, you should have seen these things in, in some course you had before. Let's see here. Proposition. 
let A, B, C, uh, C, D, and M be integers, then we have a few things. Point one, if A divides B and B divides C, then I'll let you fill in the blank. Two, if A divides B and C divides D, then I'll let you fill in the blank. Three, if M is not equal to zero, then MA divides MB if and only if fill in the blank. And finally, point four, um, if D divides A and um, A is not equal to zero, then the absolute value of D, oops, I filled in the blank, um, is less than or equal to the absolute value of A. All right. So here, instead of just filling in the blanks, I'm going to prove one or two of these and we'll fill in the blank as we, as we prove it. So let's, let's work on number, number one, for example. So suppose that A divides B and B divides C, right? What does that tell us there exist? Yeah, let's say there exist K and L in the natural, in the, the integers such that what? So if, B divi if um, A divides B, that means B is equal to, say, K times A, right? If B divides C, excuse me, that means that C is equal to what? L times B for some L, right? Okay, so you say substitute in KA for B and C equals to LB as to obtain what? C is equal to LB, but B was what? KA, which is equal to LK times A, right? Where L times K is an integer, hence what? Yeah, A divides C. So if A divides B and B divides C, A divides C. The next one, let's see here, um, <clears throat> is what? If A divides B and C divides D, it follows that AC, right, divides BD. And how about the if and only if? Yeah, just A divides B. All right. <coughs> There's, of course, a um, another proposition after this, which has some some nice nice results. I will state them. Actually, I call this a theorem. I don't know why this is a theorem. The other one's a proposition, but here it is. Um, if you have a1, a2, da da da, a k, and also the number c, and in inter all integers, right? Then um, one, we have if c divides a sub i for i equals to one, two, all the way out to k then C divides U1A1 plus U2A2 
plus da 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 plus U K A K. For any any choice of u1, u2, da da da, uk, and z. Let me put that into words here before I state the second point. Um, what this says is that if you have that uh, a particular number c divides every a sub i, right? a sub 1, a sub 2, da da da. da then C divides any integer linear combination of these, of these integers. So. Two, and it seems kind of odd here, but here it is. A divides B and B divides A um, if and only if what A is equal to plus or minus B. The proof of 1 is very much the same as the proof that I went over already today, so I'm going to skip that one. Let me look at the proof of 2 because it involves kind of a new idea. So suppose A divides B and B divides A, right? That implies what? There exists like K and L in the integers such that what? Yeah, B equals KA and A equals to LB, let's say, right? So what does that tell you? Make the substitution we did like last time, plug in, we're going to take this B, right? And we're going to plug in KA for that. And that gives us that A is equal to what? LKB, right? Was it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Duh. Hmm. Let's see here. What's the next thing I do? You know, that's not a bad idea. So let's see here. If A is not equal to 0, right, then we can divide by it, right? So 1 is equal to LK, which implies what? That either L is equal to K is equal to 1, or L is equal to K is equal to minus 1, right? Hence. A is equal to B, or A is equal to minus B. Therefore, A is equal to plus or minus B. However, there's another case, right? Well, if, if A or B equals zero, then they can't multiply. If A is equal to zero, right? Well, that's a good question. What is, you know, uh, let's look at this. Um, what does it take for, um, oh, sorry. So if A equals 0, then what? We're still assuming that A divides B, right? So that means that um, <clears throat> 0 divides B, and we also have that B divides 0, right? What does that say? Excuse me. We should be able to argue that B is equal to zero. Can you guys see how to do it? Let's see here. Which this this gives us what? Zero. Yeah, B is equal to zero is times some some some. I need some letter J. J. Sure, I think that's a good letter. Um, right. But what does that mean? B is equal to zero? 
So there you have it. A is equal to plus or minus B again. So all, re all, all, all roads lead to A is equal to plus or minus B. Proof's not done. What else, what's now, what, now what do you have to do? All right, conversely, conversely, suppose A is equal to plus or minus B, right? Well, that implies that B is equal to plus or minus A, just the same, right? And those equations clearly show that A and B are multiples of either one or minus one times the other. So both A and B are factors of each other, and it immediately follows that A divides B and B divides A. You could write more, but that's, that's it. Okay. Now, um, this, this, uh, losing my, losing my, my notes. The most important case of this really is one, and, and just the case we have two things, right? So like a simple corollary to this is what? If C divides X and C divides Y, then what? AX plus BY is divided by what? Right, then, yeah, then C, C divides AX plus BY. Right. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> moving along here, it brings me to our next definition. So this, this should make you uh, nostalgic to your youth. I, you guys are still young. What am I talking about? Let's see, your definition, um, if D divides A and D divides B, then D is what? It is a common divisor, right, of A and B. And then, of course, that gives us our next definition, which is that if A and B um, are integers not both, well, I say not both zero here. Okay, fine, not both zero. I guess I need that, yeah, I do. Um, then, the greatest common divisor of AB, well, GCD AB is equal to the greatest common divisor, all right? So just setting notation, really. What do we mean greatest common divisor? Just what it sounds like, right? You take the set of all possible common divisors, the greatest one of those is the greatest common divisor of the GCD. Um, this is well defined because um, part four of that proposition shows us what? The divisor can't do what? It can't have a magnitude which is larger than the magnitude of the thing which it divides. That's kind of, kind of common sense if you think about if A is equal to B times C, right? Certainly the, the magnitude of B can't be what? It can't be smaller than the magnitude of A because C is an integer, so it's at least one. It's usually more, right? Or it could be minus three or whatever, but still the absolute value takes care of that. All right, you're like, you know, for this being a um, introductory spiel about number theory, it's shockingly lacking in numbers, and that is a fair criticism, but let me fix that now. <clears throat> Take you to a happy place, a place without letters. A place with just numbers. Let's see here. Example. The GCD of 105 and 90, how could you calculate that? I mean, when I was a kid, basically what I learned to do was you just find the prime factorization of each. So like that's 3 times 5 times 7. Let's see, that's 35 times 3. That's 105. 90 is 3 times 3 times 2 times 5, right? 
And what do you do? You just pick the, uh, the common prime factors, right? So like, to find the GCD in terms of prime factorizations, you just like go, okay, so I got a three and a three, I got a five and a five, and that's it. So the greatest common divisor of 105 and 90 is apparently 15. <clears throat> now, of course, this is the start of a, a long story about encryption and so forth, which I'm not going to tell in here. But the difficulty to factor integers into primes, of course, is something that you use every day, all the time, right? Like RSA encryption is based on the difficulty of generalizing that to bigger numbers, right? How did I know that 105 is 3 times 5 times 7? You're like you read it from the notes. Well, and it's true. It's true. You got me. But um, <laughs> ignore that. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Right. I mean, there are different. There's uh, like a, so it was a sieve of Rastrathines or whatever his name was there, so forth. All right. So I want to describe to you now what's known as Euclid's algorithm, or sometimes. Um, Euclid's extended algorithm. So here we go. We start with a pair. Um, so it suffices to describe for A and B um, natural numbers since it's not hard to see that the GCD of A, B is equal to the GCD of like plus or minus A, plus or minus B, where I mean to indicate all possible cases, okay? That follows from the theorems we've already shown. So um, <clears throat> anyway, so we start out here uh, with A and B, all right? So start with AB, basically, and you apply the division algorithm. Right? That gives us what? That gives us that A is equal to Q1 times B plus R1, where what? 0 is less than or equal to R1 is less than B. <clears throat> so now if, if R1 is equal to 0, then what? That means that A is equal to Q1B, right? So what's the, what's the greatest common divisor of A and B if this is the case? A. A. Very good. All right. So what, what else then? So what do you do next? Otherwise, right, R1 is not equal to 0, right? So we can apply the division algorithm uh, to instead of A comma B, we can do B comma R1. So basically, R1 now is playing the role B did in the last step, right? And B has moved into the role that A played in the first step. And then we apply division algorithm. This gives us the B is equal to Q2 times R1 plus R2, where 0 is less than or equal to R2 is less than R1. Right. Now, if, our, if R2 is equal to 0, right, then what does that tell us? I mean, it gives us, of course, B is equal to Q2 R1. So B would be the GCD? So B would be the GCD? Let's see here. Let's see here. Let me. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, 
I don't, wait a minute, I'm not sure about that. And I don't know if I believe that. Ah, yes, also, thank you. <clears throat> so you guys fish me into something. <laughs> Stupid. Let's see here. Oh, yowzers. Let's think about that for a second here. So, how can I say this? Um, Right, because this, this equation here, I mean, it, it's what Jess is saying is, is very reasonable, right? What, what does this equation say? Let's put it into words. What does, this, what does this say about B as it relates to A? Right, so B is a divisor of A, right? So the greatest common divisor of, I mean, any divisor of B cannot be larger than B, right? A is larger than B, for example. But anyway, so yes, the greatest common divisor of A and B is B, because B is both a divisor of B, obviously, and B is a divisor of A by what's in red. So B is the greatest common divisor. Now here, the greatest common divisor, we can argue, in fact, the greatest common divisor of A and B. Well, by the same logic, um, by the same logic we made in the first thing, this says the greatest common divisor of like B and R1 is what? R1, right. But in fact, that's also going to be the greatest common divisor of A comma. Now, can you guys tell me why the greatest common divisor of AB should be equal to the greatest common divisor of B and R1? Why is the greatest common divisor of A and B related to the greatest common divisor of B and R1 here? Well, I'm not assuming R1 is equal to zero down here, yeah. right? But how about, how about this, though? Can you substitute that with the original A equals Q um, and B plus R1 equation? Mm-hmm. Rearrange the terms. I think that's one way you could see it. Let's see here. So you're like, one way you could see this would be the fact that A is equal to Q1 times B, but B is what? Q2, R1 plus R2, which we're saying is zero at the moment. So let me put an arrow to zero there. Um, lost my place, A plus B, L plus R1, right? And so what's that say? That says that um, A is equal to Q1, um, Q2 plus one, all times R1, right? Thus, R1 is a divisor of A. Now, if we had internalized the proposition I erased here, we wouldn't have to go through these details. You could just see this as a consequence of the proposition I wrote, right? Um, or, I mean, I, I called it a core, well, oh man. I have buried the lead, dude. Uh, I'm about to collectively call you dudes. Let me not do that. Let's see here. Um, there's a very important lemma that I have, in my exuberance, omitted, much to our, damp, um, you know, uh, <coughs> not helpful to omit this. This is lemma 1.4.13. If I had stated this lemma, you all would be like, oh, well, duh. But here it is. Um, if A, B, C, excuse me, if A, B, Q, and R, are in the integers um, I'm excuse me, not an if, this is just a let. The integers is their home. Let these be integers. If we have that A is equal to QB plus R, all right, then the greatest common divisor of A and B is equal to the greatest common divisor of B and R. So that's the lemma. We're just working that lemma out here in a particular case, really.
And that follows from the corollary that I have up in the corner, really. Um, right? C divides X, C divides Y, C divides AX plus BY. So the, to, to prove that they have this, the, the greatest common divisor of A and B is equal to the greatest common divisor of B and R, the proof basically follows this. What you want to do is show that A and B and B and R have the same divisors. All right, so like, um, you notice that the key then, of course, is just this equation here, right, which is what? <clears throat> you can rewrite this as R, right, is equal to A minus QB, for example. So if something is a divisor of A and B, right, it's also a divisor of R. Right? And of course the divisors of B are the divisors of B. So they basically, it's almost immediate from this equation and what a divisor is, this, this lemma. But once you know that, all right, once you know that, then what that says then is that the, as you go through this algorithm, the greatest common divisor of A and B is going to be the greatest common divisor of <coughs> B and R1, and so forth, right? What happens if R2 is not equal to zero? Then we can write, <coughs> excuse me, R1 is equal to Q3 times R2 plus R3 for zero less than or equal to R3 less than R2. And again, we'll be able to argue that the GCD of AB is equal to the GCD, I mean, more to the point, we can basically, from the step above, by the same, same logic, we can argue that the GCD of, excuse me, um, B and R1 is equal to the GCD of R1 and R2. And so then it gets linked back to the GCD of A and B. And this just keeps going and going and going until eventually you get zero. How do I know that eventually you get zero? Excuse me. How do I know that this can't go on forever? How are these remainders related? There's, yeah, they're strictly decreasing, right? Yeah, R1 is less the, is greater than, you know, greater than R2. R3 is greater than R, uh, R2. So, um, and R1 is bounded above by B. So there are at most B steps here, if B is positive, right? I'm describing it for B positive too. So, all right. So that, that's a, um, a sketch of the algorithm in general. Um, my notes are a little bit better than what I said here. Uh, that's usually the case. Let me show you an example. I think the example is helpful. <clears throat> I'm going to use what I did in the notes in the interest of not <laughs> doing stupid things. So let's find, find the greatest common divisor of 100 and 44. All right. So basically, this is my A and this is my B, all right? So step one, I notice that 100 is equal to 44 times 2 plus 12, right? So 88 plus 12 is 100. <clears throat> Obviously, um, what do we have here? I mean, just, I'm just identifying things. R, apparently, R1 is equal to 12. Right? Okay, so then <clears throat> step two, I try to write B, which is what? 44, as what? Some multiple of 12. Let's see here. So 12 is what? I think I can get three of those, right? 
36 minus 44 is what? 8 plus 8. Okay, so remainder 2 is 8. Still not done. Step 3. Let's see here. Um, what am I supposed to bring down? Uh, 12 is equal to 8 times 1 plus 4. All right. So apparently R3 is equal to, I mean, you don't have to write these over here. I'm just doing it for the sake of uh, specificity. Uh, 4. And then 4, step 4, I guess what? Then what? 8 is equal to 4 times 2 plus 0. Uh-oh. Done. Halt. And so the last non-zero remainder is the GCD, right? So from this, we cipher what? The GCD of 144 is equal to 4. Notice that we did not use prime factorization to do this. Well, not directly anyway. I mean, you might have used, I can't, you know, I, you, you search your heart. You may have used primes in here somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. I, uh, but this is, this is, that alone is the Euclidean algorithm. The extended Euclidean al algorithm does a little bit more. The extended Euclidean algorithm shows us how we can write 4 as an integer linear combination of 144. So 4 is equal to some, some k times 100 plus some l times 44. What are the, you may use a and b. Oh, bad choice. Let's not use A and B. Um, <laughs> I used A and B for something else, didn't I? So what are the K and the L? And how do you figure them out? Right, so some of you have seen this in your previous class. You go backwards, right? You just kind of work your way back up. So like this tells me what? This tells me 8 is 4 times 2. So 12 is equal to 4 times 2, right? That's 4. And then I can plug that in here. 44 is equal to 12, which was 4 times 2 plus 4 plus 8, right? And then I can plug, that, plug them in here. 100, what's that? Times oh, times 3. Thank you. I'm about to, thank you. I was about to unleash a world, a world of hurt on myself. Thank you. Um, plus 8, Does it, the, th the 3, this 3. And then I take this and I plug it back into that 44, and that gives me 100 is equal to. 4 times 2 plus 4 times 3 plus 8, big parentheses are our friends, times 2 plus 12. And I think if I tilt my head and squint and look at that for a minute, I ought to be able to find the combination I'm looking for. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to write 4. Where's my 4? Schnikes. Oh, sorry, this 12 is what? I, I neglected something. So 12 is equal to what? 8 times 1 plus 4, which is what? Yeah, 4 times 2. I think I need to do that too, right? So plus 4, yeah, thank you. Is that helpful? Well, I can solve for 4, right? So basically, solve what I've put up here for 4. What do you get? You've got to resist the temptation to multiply stuff off, out too much, right? So solving this for this 4 gives me what 4 is equal to? Over here, 100, right? Minus what? Oh, I don't think I've been smart enough about this. What is this? This is 44, right? Oh, shnikes. That's not what still I want. Huh. This is not complicated, you guys. I just should actually look at my notes. You start, you start with 4 equals 12 minus 8 times 1. Go back to like 
get through and go for it. And then you substitute in the A. You substitute in the remainder right. each time. Yeah, let's try this again. <clears throat> well, I showed you how not to do it. All right, so again, we're trying to find K and L, right? So what do you say I should do? So start with 4 equals um, 12 minus 8. All right. And then go ahead and keep, keep the 4 out in front. So mm -hmm. 4 equals 12 minus parentheses 44 minus 12 times 3. Ah. That's 4 times, yeah, okay, 4 times 12 minus 44. And then you take 4 equals 4 times. Oh, sorry. I lost my place, guys. Um, you're, so that this is what? So 4, if you substitute 12. I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to use, the, I'm, I'm using the 12 is equal to 100 minus 44 times 2. So use that up in here. We get what, 4? Okay. Minus 44. Minus 44. And then we have only, we got 44s and 100s all around. Yay. So 4 is equal to, we got 4 times 100. Minus, you say 9? Times 44. So I think every, I mean, most, most people can understand the Euclidean algorithm without too much trouble, right? Like this is kind of straightforward once you do it. Like if you just see somebody do it, you don't really understand it. You have to do it for yourself, right? The only way to internalize this algorithm is actually do it for a couple numbers. But by about the third one, you should be bored. I mean, I don't know. But then this is also, there's, there's nothing especially quirky about what we just did. The same pattern works for any of these, all right? There's no like extra sneaky thing that we did here to make this one work. What we did will work for other examples, all right? Um, so who cares? I mean, what, what's the point of this? <clears throat> I feel I owe you a second example. <laughs> Here, I want to find one that's more exciting. How about this one? Yeah, find the example GCD of 240 and 11. All right, so first of all, we've got 240 is equal to 11 times 21 plus 9. 11 times 21 is 210 plus 21. 231 plus 9 is 240. Um, and then 11 is equal to what? It's equal to 9 times 1 plus 2. And then what? 9 is equal to 2 times 4 plus 1. And finally, we get 2 is equal to 1 times 2. Okay. There. So what's this show? The last non-zero remainder is the GCD. So the GCD, and this is not shocking, I think. You probably, probably could have told me this without doing this calculation, that the greatest common divisor of 240 and 11 is 1. Right? These numbers are relatively prime. You know this because you have some sense of prime factorizations, right? Even if you've never thought about it terribly systematically from your youth, you have understood something about prime factorizations, right? So. Of course, what's more interesting then is to write, we want to do then what? We want to write 1 is equal to some, you know, some a times, times 240. Oh, fine, I'll use k and l. k times 240 plus l times 11. How do we figure those out? That's really what I'm after here. 
I mean, the greatest common divisor of two numbers, I don't think is, I mean, I, I'm not a number theorist, so it's not that exciting to me personally. Uh, you know, if, if it's exciting to you, great. But uh, this, to me, is interesting that we can find such a KNL by a systematic method. Okay, so then what? So here's what I do. I say 1 is equal to 9. So where am I starting with? 9 minus 2 times 4. So that is from this, right? I'm solving this for 1. So you take, let me number these, 1, 2, 3. So I take step 3 and I, I solve for the, the GCD. And then <coughs> the next step, I'm going to use this. I solve this for 2. And I plug it in here, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, so this is equal to 9 minus, let's see, your solve for 2, I've got 11 minus 9 <coughs> times 4. And then what's my next step here? What's that? Oh, okay. So you're like, it pays to uh, do a little simplification here. So that's, you say that's 5 times 9. Yeah, that's true. Now that you mention that, I have a vague memory from, see, I wanted to teach this course right after I taught, num taught number theory because I knew I would have this stuff in my mind. Mm -hmm. Dr. Joseph taught number theory last, last year, which means number theory is gone <laughs> for me. <laughs> you know, many things I proved in number theory, those things are gone now for me. <laughs> And then what? Oh, solve for 9, right? You need 11 times 4. Well. Oh, 11 times 4, thank you. Yeah, that's kind of important. So we get 5 times 9 minus what I just get done saying, solve for 9. So 9 is equal to 240, right? Minus 11 times 21, parentheses, um, minus 11 times 4, right? And so they can rearrange that. We get what? We get 5 times 240. And how many, how many 11s do we get? Minus 55. Looks like minus 59 copies of 11, right? Oh, I think I did that wrong. 5 times 21. 5 times 21. Oh, it's 105, right? I'm an idiot. 105, so that's actually 100 and 109, I say in the notes, so I'm probably right there. I mean, the notes are usually right. Let's see here. Except when, when they're not right, right, Lorenzo? <laughs> U4 is U10. Yes, 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 okay. Sorry about that. Um, questions? All right, so, yep. Well, it's just collecting things. There's one 9 here, and there's 4 over here, because minus minus gives me plus. So 4 plus 1 is 5. Yeah, That I can explain. <laughs> OK, so, um, so I've got 20 more minutes of class left, right? No, I think my original plan to just cover uh, the basics was accurate. And um, so <laughs> there. <laughs> but I want to say something. <laughs> Um, so first of all, the fact that there exists this KNL, this is what's known as. Uh, but can can anybody tell me how to say that? Bezu, Bezu, all right, Bezu's identity. Yes, Bezu's identity says that um, you can always write the greatest common divisor of two integers as an integer linear combination of the integers. What's that? Well, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Great. I didn't know that, but now this calculation we just did, what does this mean? So here's what we're going to talk about next time is I'm going to try to put into uh, modular arithmetic on a firm grounding, right? We'll define, I'm trying to work, look at those things carefully and if things go well tomorrow, I will 
lead us all the way to how to calculate the inverse of a, of a matrix in terms of modular coefficients and so forth. But this right here, we can see things from this, right? So like modulo, but you guys already know, you guys already know some modular arithmetic. So let me just reap some low-hanging low fruit here while we're at it. Modulo 11, um, and this is kind of stupid, 5 inverse is equal to what? 250. <laughs> modulo, uh, let's see here, modulo 5, we also have that uh, 11 inverse is equal to minus 109. <laughs> These are kind of stupid. Mod 250, mod 250, what can I read from this? I can read from this that uh, 11 inverse is equal to minus 109. Ow. Thank you. By the way, there was an error like that at the end of last lecture. Um, uh, Lorenzo pointed out to me that I, I missed an F, and so like the thing I concluded with last time wasn't quite right. You can easily fix it, though. And what I have in the notes, I think, is a legit example. Mod 109, what do we have? What can you say mod 109? You can say that 5 inverse is equal to 240. Right, because in terms of modular arithmetic, you know, if you look at any of these four numbers, that's zero, half of this, right? And you're left with the product of two numbers is equal to one, which is to say that they're the multiplicative inverse in the modular system. So this Bazou's identity actually shows us how to calculate inverses in terms of modular arithmetic systematically. Of course, for small, num for small n, though, you should just guess inverses, right? Like if you're going through the extended Euclidean algorithm to calculate the inverse of 3 in mod 6, <laughs> well, congratulations, but you're wasting your time. I mean, anyway, speaking of wasting time, let me stop wasting your time. That's all I have for today. Thanks, guys.